Holy Gospel according to Luke chapter 17. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was going through the region between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, ten lepers approached him. Keeping their distance, they called out, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were made clean. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. He prostrated himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus asked, Were not ten made clean? But the other nine, where are they? Was none of them found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, Get up and go on your way. Your faith has made you well. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Many of us first met him as Ace Ventura, pet detective. He gained superhuman power by wearing the mask. He was the Riddler, nemesis of Batman. He was the Grinch who ties the seal Christmas. He was dumb and dumber, too. And he was God. Many of you know I'm talking about Jim Carrey, the actor who, playing a man by the name of Bruce, who had just had a monumentally bad day, complained that if there was a God, God was doing a pathetic job of doing his job. Which, by the way, if you were here last week, you may recall, is pretty much the same complaint the prophet Habakkuk complained about God. In Habakkuk's case, God, played by God, somehow spoke to the prophet And in response to his complaint, in Bruce's case, God, played by Morgan Freeman, arranged a face-to-face meeting with Bruce in which he said to him, so you think you could do a better job. Bruce, thinking he was being pranked, said anybody could do a better job. God said, well, I could use a little time off. The job's yours for a while. And so for a few days, Bruce was Bruce Almighty. It's a comedy. But in the end, it delivers a a message that's not comedic. It's about seeing your blessings. Even on your worst day, Jim Carrey said in an interview shortly after the film came out, it's about taking the time, even in your darkest days, to name the things you're grateful for. There are always things to be grateful for. And when you start to do that, he said... It doesn't take all that much time before you start to realize how rich you are. In our gospel text for today, we meet a group of people who aren't sure they have anything whatsoever to be grateful for, and so we read that as Jesus entered a village, ten lepers approached him, keeping their distance, it says, lepers, people with leprosy which was one of the most dreaded diseases in Bible times. It ate away at the body, fingers and toes, even noses sometimes eventually would would rot away and fall off as the disease progressed and there was no known cure. What's more, since diagnostic procedures were what they were 2,000 years ago, sometimes people with not leprosy but other skin conditions like eczema or psoriasis got diagnosed, labeled, branded as lepers and were treated as such. Which meant, since people back then believed that leprosy was highly contagious, it meant that they left their homes, they weren't allowed to be in their hometowns, instead they were forced to live life out in isolation with the only people they were allowed to get near, which were other lepers or people who had been labeled and branded as such. And they were not allowed to get within 50 yards of anyone who was not leprous, including their own family members. And so unlike today, where where hospice organizations, for example, 
do all they can to allow someone with a terminal disease to die surrounded by love. The lepers suffered the effects of their diseases, separated from those they loved, their families, their synagogues, their communities, and no doubt many of them who prayed at all, prayed that death would come soon and end their suffering. But in today's story, says Luke, Jesus is journeying through the region between Judea, between Galilee and Samaria, which some commentators have kind of snarkily commentated, indicates that Luke must have been a D student in geography because, in fact, there is no region between Samaria and Galilee. The two areas border each other. I'm of the opinion that Luke knew all the geography he needed to know. It's just that he wasn't writing a geography book. The land between Samaria and Galilee, I think what Luke is saying here is that maybe geography, geographically, but more so socially, emotionally, even spiritually, this was the middle of nowhere, which, of course, is the kind of place that Jesus always liked going because the middle of nowhere is a great place to find people thought to be nobodies. And if there's one thing we know absolutely for sure about Jesus is that he loved the world's nobodies. I mean, especially when Luke is telling the story, it's pretty clear that any time, given the choice between a somebody and a nobody, the nobodies were Jesus' favorites. So here we are in the, in the region between Samaria and Galilee, the middle of nowhere, where ten nobodies, ten lepers somehow or another heard that Jesus is in nowhere land. And they'd heard somehow that he had healed people. They heard that not long ago he had healed a leper. And so they went to him. Well, they went to within 50 yards of him. In those days, if lepers got closer than 50 yards, you were completely allowed by the law to throw stones at them to make sure they kept their distance. And so from a distance, Luke says, because he knows his spiritual geography, from the outside, looking in, they cried out to him, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Mercy. Mercy is an act of kindness or compassion that isn't kindness or compassion one can make a case that you deserve. No doubt these lepers had been told by spiritual friends. You know the spiritual friends that I'm talking about, the ones who have answers to great mysteries and are delighted to share them. No doubt they had been told by spiritual friends the same thing that Job has been told by his spiritual friends when he was suffering, and that is the reason that they are suffering is because they're getting what they deserve. Because good things don't happen, bad things don't happen to good people. Bad things almost always happen just to people who've done something bad. Jesus, by the way, elsewhere, named that attitude for the oversimplistic pile of spiritual what in the world are you talking about nonsense that it is. He doesn't go into that here, however. Instead, when the lepers from their required distance cry to him for mercy for not what they deserve, hearing them, He stops, and from a distance, presumably from 50 yards, he shouts to them, go and show yourselves to the priests. Which maybe sounds odd to us, except that in those days the priests were also the public health officers. People cured of infectious diseases needed to go to the priest for certification that allowed them to re-enter their community, their life, their home, their family, their church. The Greek word that's translated here to say that, in fact, they turned and left and started off to do that carries a connotation that they did that kind of slowly. They didn't, this is not a story of them running off. And that slowness to their doing what Jesus said leads some to say that maybe this is a sign of their weakness of faith. Yeah, we want to judge them again. But I think, I think of it as more of a, well, of course, sign of their humility, their humanity, I mean. Because 
they had already shown themselves to a priest. He's the one who told them they belonged here. They sent the priest is the one who sent them here for being lepers. And they could see they were still lepers. So they went slowly because they didn't understand. Slowly or not, however, they did as Jesus commanded, which newsflash is always a good idea, even if you don't understand. Sometimes the things that God does for us maybe don't happen, and then God sends us on our way. Sometimes the thing God has in mind to do for us happen on the way. Of course, no one can understand what happened next because what happened next was a miracle. As those ten lepers went on their way to the priest, the fingers reappeared, the noses that were gone reappeared. Suddenly they start to find a vitality in their bodies that they hadn't felt in some cases maybe for years. And Luke tells us all of that simply by saying this, as they went on their way, They were made clean. They were healed of their leprosy. And realizing they were healed, who can even imagine? They were ecstatic. And ecstatically, they what? Well, this is where the story starts to get to its crunch time, as it tells us that what nine of the ten did was keep going. But one of them, who happens to be a Samaritan, Luke does mention, because of all the gospel writers, Luke likes noticing the detail, especially the detail of the fact that people whom whom the world or we think are losers, he loves pointing out when those people end up being the heroes in God's eyes. And that's precisely the case here, Luke says, when one of them, a Samaritan, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God, with a loud voice and he fell down at Jesus' feet and he thanked him for the mercy, the undeserved kindness and compassion which he, he and all of them had been shown. And surely as he comes, Jesus in his mouth but his eyes is smiling. But then he looks up and and looks off and that smile on his his lips and in his eyes begins to fade and he says ten were healed where are the nine is the only one who saw this as an occasion for God to be thanked and praised this foreigner but then again he turns from the nine who aren't there to say to the one who is there And this is the crunch time punchline of the story, and it's way interesting. He says to the one who had come back to fall down to the ground in gratitude, get up and go on your way. Your faith has made you well. Now think about this. Jesus had shown mercy, undeserved compassion and kindness to ten. He had healed, cleansed, blessed, Ten. Only one of them returned to give thanks. And it is to that one, and it's only that one, because the Greek word used here is singular. We say you, you, and we can't tell. The Greek words you can tell. The Greek word used here is singular. When he says your faith, singular, has made you, singular, well. And here you need to realize something seriously interesting. The Greek word for well that Luke uses here refers to more than physical wellness. They all, after all, have been made physically well. This one, this one only, Jesus says, is well with wellness that is not just wellness in his body, but wellness in his soul and wellness in his relationship with God. That's what the word used conveys. Because why? Because apparently he's not only been blessed, he's grateful for his blessings. Luther, in the small catechism, in his explanation to the fourth petition of the Lord's Prayer, give us this day our daily bread. 
First of all, says that daily bread refers to everything that we need in our daily lives. Notice everything we need. It does not say give us this, uh, this day our daily caviar, our daily filet. It says give us this day our daily bread, what we need. Not necessarily everything we want, certainly not necessarily everything people spend millions of dollars making commercials telling you you can't possibly live without. But then Luther says, in fact, God not just to good people, but for all people. God, in fact, gives daily bread. God gives us what we truly need. God gives us more than we need, even before we ever get around to asking it. Which means, he says, that the important thing about this prayer, give us this day our daily bread, is to help us realize that and, quote, and you memorized this, some of you, to receive our daily bread with thanks. Now, there are people in the world, of course, who don't have some of the very basic things they need. Let's be honest, we by and large aren't them. We are blessed. The question is, are we the nine? blessed and running merrily along to do our own thing, or are we the one, the one who is blessed and spiritually well because he is grateful to God for every good thing? Greg Anderson, in his book Living Life on Purpose, tells a story about a man whose wife had left him and he was terribly depressed. He'd lost faith in himself. He'd lost faith in his friends. He'd lost faith in God. His life, he said, had become joyless. One rainy, joyless morning, he found his way to the small neighborhood restaurant where he he sat down for breakfast. Several people were in that diner, but no one was speaking to anyone else, which suited him just fine. Miserably, he hunched over the counter, stirring his coffee. And in one of the small booths was a window where a young mother was with her little girl, and they had just been served their food when the little girl spoke loudly enough for all to hear, Mommy, don't we say our prayers here? And the waitress said, of course, sweetheart, we say our prayers here. Would you mind saying the prayers for us? And the little girl looked up and loudly enough for all to hear said, bow your heads. And people bowed their heads. And then the little girl said, God is great, God is good, and we thank him for our food. Amen. That prayer changed the atmosphere in that gloomy place, in that gloomy day. People started to talk to each other. The waitress said, we should do that every morning. And the depressed and discouraged man talking about it later said, all of a sudden, my whole frame of mind started to improve. From that little girl's example, I started to thank God for all that I did have and stopped majoring in all that I didn't have I started to be grateful, and gratitude, he says, healed him. Back to our story. No, better yet, back to us. Better yet, back to you. Are you healed? Are you well? The answer to that question The story from Luke 17 seems to be telling us is very much related to your answer to this question. How often to God and to others do you say, thank you? For we aren't truly well or truly blessed just because we're blessed. We are well and richly blessed when we're grateful for our blessings. Blessings which, of course, the truly grateful are also grateful to realize, give them the opportunity generously to be a blessing to others. At least that's what back in the day Jesus told one of the ten in Luke 17. And now here we are today. What's Jesus telling you? That you need way more of what you don't have? Or that you need all the way down to your soul You need to be more grateful for what you already have been given. Given by whom? 
given by God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above ye. Yeah.